Hello, this is Branko Malic. In this podcast, we'll talk about uh, a particular kind of psychology. Not mentality so much, mind you. You know, I use this word mentality in quite a technical sense. And it has very precise meaning. Uh, of course, uh, there'll be some of that too, because you cannot uh, evade it when you talk about uh, the what we might call ontological moods. That is to say, the states uh, of uh, emotional and states uh, of understanding the world in general, all people have. Uh, but uh, that are not intellectually refined or intellect, uh, no intellectual essence has been extrapolated from them. Uh, this is more what I think by, uh, think by uh, psychology. Uh, so we will be talking about a certain mood. And this mood is the mood that is typical for people who are materialists. That is to say, not materialists in the sense that they love money, but in the sense that they uh, have this irrevocable belief uh, that everything that is, is a matter. Now, those who follow Kali Tribune know, but those who are new to this uh, don't so I'll repeat it I don't believe that materialism is so much a prevalent uh, stance in our day and age it was maybe up to 50 60 years ago not to say in the 19th uh, half uh, second half of 19th century and it was in its heyday but its heyday is 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 way past and this kind of thinking is in fact in my mind uh, and coming from my experience uh still to be found uh with uh, what is uh with people who are sometimes called old left that is to say among communists because supposedly uh, left of today is not communist it's something more or something less uh therefore uh in order to illustrate what i mean by this by this very peculiar and very dark just to say an advanced extremely dark mood that is usually hidden as all those ontological moods are by the surface personality of a man is to take uh, explanation and description of this attitude of this both mental and emotional attitude in the words of communists and one communist of that kind that we still have alive today is none other than Slovenian Slavoj Žižek. So uh, we'll, we'll let Slavoj tell us a few things about uh, what he understands the world to be. Is What would be my what they call it, spontaneous attitude towards the universe. It's a very dark one. The first one, the first thesis would have been a kind of total vanity. There is nothing, basically. I mean it quite literally. Like, ultimately, ultimately there are just some fragments, some vanishing things. If you look at the universe, it's one big void. But then how do things emerge? Here, I feel a kind of spontaneous affinity with quantum physics, where, you know, the idea there is that universe is a void, but a kind of a positively charged void. And then particular things appear when the balance of the void is disturbed. And I like this idea spontaneously very much, that the fact that it's not just nothing, things are out there. It means something went terribly wrong. That what we call creation is a kind of a cosmic imbalance, cosmic catastrophe, that things exist by mistake. And I'm even ready to go to the end and to claim that the only way to counteract is, is to assume the mistake and go to the end. And we have a name for this, it's called love. Isn't love precisely this kind of a cosmic imbalance? I was always disgusted with this notion of I love the world, universal love. I don't like the world. I don't know how I basically am somewhere in between. I hate the world or I'm indifferent towards it. But the whole of reality is just it. It's stupid. It is out there. I don't care about it. Love for me is an extremely 
violent act. Love is not I love you all. Love means I pick out something and I and it's it's again this structure of imbalance. Even if this something is just a small detail, a fragile individual person, I say I love you more than anything else. In this quite formal sense, love is evil. So that was that was Zizek articulate as always with a note uh, and always with a note of a guile you never know uh, is he joking or not but i think he is not joking here i think he genuinely believes this and it will be my task now to try to some uh, somewhat not somehow but somewhat demonstrate it to you who are maybe never met people like him because uh, Zizek is a part of the old world of Yugoslavia and uh, consequently of this continental to Eastern Europe where communism was abroad, where communism was uh, ruling. And he is part of, of the peculiar brand of leftists that were on the, always in co intellectual conflict uh, with an existing communist regime but were in fact and stayed uh, communists uh, because Zizek is a Leninist uh, kind of like neo-Bolshevik he's not he's not some kind of uh, um, gay activist or whatever uh, maybe it's a, it's not a good example but uh, uh, one of those uh, the kids uh, with blue or violet hair they call them social justice warriors keyboard warriors or whatever he is a bolshevik communist and he knows for instance that in order to have a revolution you have to spill blood and such things and he doesn't shy from it although he hides very well that he is aware of this and this is that this is something he even dreams of i had a i had one 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 video interpreting one essay of his on robespierre uh, that i think amply demonstrates this but that's not I issue now now these people uh, are very have very peculiar feature in their expression and i remember this very well from my younger days uh, by reading some of those journalists uh, that started even in writing for mladina that's the uh, um, magazine a uh, slovenian magazine from the 80s it's still i think it's still publishing but in the 80s it was kind of like a, a point of the wedge of this uh, reforms in slovenia and croatia and these western republics of uh, yugoslavia and they have this peculiar uh, very peculiar sense those that are good among them and not all of them uh, and Zizek is a good representative. Uh, this is a kind of underlying, unredeemable pessimism that I always felt about those people. It was not about their arguments. Uh, it is not about their standpoints. It's about uh, the, the atmosphere they radiate. And to make this statement a bit more comprehensible to rationality, Atmosphere is something uh, that emanates from the metaphors and the tropes they use in their writing and speech. And those metaphors and tropes, or uh, let's say analogies or whatever, uh, the instruments of language they choose, uh, were always those concerning death, dying, decomposition putrefication and so on and so forth now when you write satire when you write criticism uh, you want to uh, choose words carefully in order to choose your even syntax carefully in order to uh, bring about the most devastating effect and as communist writers are never very uh, merciful or gracious towards their opponents, this was one of the reasons why those people used it. And uh, I'm, I myself, who am on a completely opposite side of them, I also cannot say for myself that I am very gracious when I'm writing a critique of something that I despise, to say it the least. But there is something in the choice of these metaphors uh, that always gave me extremely bad feeling 
Although not seldomly, uh, when it comes to social criticism of actual events, for instance, in my country, I read, I was following some of those old left journalists, I couldn't, but I agree, uh, they, they are very good, they tend to be very good journalists, they're not stupid men, they're not very intelligent also, well, they're not, they are superficial, because they are, uh, everything for them is politics, and not everything is politics, and once you make this decision, and if you are leftist, especially communist, this is the decision you will make, rest assured, uh, you kind of cut yourself from a higher level of, of insight forever. That is until you uh, decide to reject your mentality or mental attitude, but they didn't never do that. It tends to be apparently revocable. Uh, there was something that <coughs> just couldn't, I just couldn't accept. Something, and I'll say it in a word, alien about them. That may be a personality uh, differences or something like that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, what I want to posit here is that this comes from a specific mentality that lies in the background of this mood of those people, of their sense of the world, of their comprehension of being as Heidegger would put it because I use Heidegger with high degree of qualifications <coughs> uh, 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 with with bracket with uh, with uh, uh, very uh, strict reservations but this idea of the ontological mood is really heuristically very good I think but it had, can take you only only uh, only to a certain length and what have Slavoj said they ask me what is his, they ask him, excuse me, what is his attitude towards the universe. And he says, it's a very dark one. The first one, the first thesis, as he's like thinking dialectically, would have been a kind of total vanity. Because vanity comes from nothingness, from appreciation or and uh, uh, elevation of nothingness. There is nothing basically. I mean it quite literary. Like, ultimately, there are just some fragments, some vanishing things. If you look at the universe, it's one big void. Now, this is materialist attitude. There are worst attitudes of materialist one. It is disgusting. It is dead, in a sense. It is dead as corpse is dead. You know, that this is something that pervades materialism. Because it is based on this idea of physical nothing. And what is physical nothing? It is void. Now, what I mean by this? Namely, first, Zizek is not right here. Uh, there is nothing basically quite literary. And then he says there are some fragments. This is not nothing. Because nothing, as a term, has to encompass both inner and outer, both intrinsic and extrinsic reality. The nothing of Zizek is only extrinsic nothing. It spreads to intrinsic, <coughs> excuse me, intrinsic nature only by virtue of reflection. Because in materialist uh, worldview or mentality or attitude uh, what is inner is a reflection of what is outer it's not autonomous so everything are conscious what they call consciousness uh, consciousness for them is the only substance of uh, human being that is not material but it is a reflection of matter it is kind of like emanation from matter uh, it was a very, in, in fact, pretty nonsensical term. I talked a bit about that, and I'll talk more in the future, but it's a very contaminated, very loaded term. But it has, in fact, it has a precise meaning. Uh, this is uh, how they see nothing, because they cannot think about anything that is not corporeal or material. Because material and corporeal are not the same thing. Corporeal is much better term. And corporeal analogon, of nothing is void. I mean void does not exist in the metaphysical sense of nothing. It exists in the physical sense of lack of something. 
that can be described or that can be perceived and so on and so forth that can be lived in breathed and so on it's a symbol more like and this void uh, for, in some sense you might say that this what we call outer space uh, is, is a very good symbol of nothingness because it, it is like explosion of uh, things, material, corporeal things uh, dispersing into infinity. But that's the different story, of course. And this is how it looks. This is, this is, I think, where this feeling of morbidity, of this completely alien, alien character of these people, to somebody who uh, doesn't intuitively see things this way. And what I want to point out is that this is very important is that these altitudes, these, these are not things that change. I think theoretically they can change, but very, very rarely. Uh, now, these are serious people. Zizek, uh, Zizek is a joker and he's a charlatan in many aspects, but he and he's an insubstantial man. And here he tells you why he is. But he's serious in a sense that he really uh, acts upon what is in him acts upon void that is uh, whereas somebody who feels him as an alien is also a serious man but acts upon completely opposite and what makes us such what makes Zizek and Zizek's opposite who they are is something that is rather mysterious these are what one might call metaphysical decisions people make maybe even at very early age and then everything uh, consequently is uh, derived from them so Zizek continues but then how do things emerge here I feel a kind of spontaneous affinity with quantum physics where you know the idea there is that the universe is a void but a kind of positively charged void and then particular things appear when the balance of the void is disturbed and I like this idea spontaneously very much the fact that is not just not things out there. It means something went terribly wrong. That what we call creation is a kind of cosmic imbalance, a cosmic catastrophe. That things exist by mistake. And I'm even ready to go to the end and claim that the only way to counteract this is to assume the mistake and go to the end. Now what he wants to say here, let's leave quantum physics aside, but aside because I don't believe he is very well versed in it. <coughs> he understands world as a mistake. That is to say, he understands something like uh, shock in the body of nothing. That is to say, uh, he understands uh, incorporated matter, matter that makes some kind of sense, uh, as opposed to the void as something that comes to pass by complete mistake and this is very much a materialist uh, materialist standpoint this is also clearly clearly agnostic point G not agnostic gnostic in the sense of gnosticism point now uh, it is a very loaded thing to uh, charge communists with gnosticism and leftists although it is true uh, in general i would say in general principle is it is true but i think first to do this was Eric Wogelin, but uh, it kind of people kind of tend to to re, uh, uh, to do a reductio ad gnosticorum that everything is reduced to this gnosticism, this idea that we live in alienated, uh, mistakenly created world that we have to redeem and people of special knowledge, elite people can do that. And, I think essentially it it hits the mark, but there are devil is always in the details and nuances, and we here we are interested in nuances, not what people repeated an infinitum before us. <clears throat> so this is what he says here, and this uh, this is in fact uh, what we would call dialectical materialism. Uh, you will remember that he said at the beginning there was a void. And uh, the first thesis he called it, this is dialectical affirmation and negation of this void is its absolute other. Its absolute other is something that is to say uh, something that disturbs it. It's a disturbance in it. 
and then there should be some kind of Marxist dialectical material synthesis of these two that would probably be dynamical, it's probably revolution and so on and so forth. And he says, I want to take this mistake and go with it all the way. Now, this is a telltale, so this is very peculiar for leftists of old mold. Uh, that is to say, who really were uh, radicals. Uh, they were, they were not. Uh, they, they had a need to go all the way to do a radical thing. Uh, there is nothing. The two things always, always uh, impressed me in lefties. On the one hand, absolute hatred of what they call bourgeois. And only recently, when I was working abroad in the West, some times ago, some year or two ago, I, I, I encountered this in, in young, one young man of some 25, 28 years was uh, criticizing bourgeois. I thought that younger generation never heard about this term because uh, bourgeois, this uh, citizen, citoyen, uh, in the sense of uh, mid uh, middle class uh, white collar conforming man or woman and so oh, excuse me man woman cannot be blamed or anything because they are uh, sacrosanct in leftism in new leftism I thought that those people don't exist in the same sense it existed for communists and they were the main enemy uh, they were the target to destroy what what is everything they did in leftist eyes was contemptible it was philistine as they would say but what always fascinated me uh, was uh, the bourgeois bourgeois mentality of the leftist themselves and they keep it as such especially these old leftists because this idea to go all the way to go radical is the idea of somebody who is initially not radical who is part of this uh, mild, uh, let's say, undisturbed uh, conformist milieu. I think almost all of them. You have working working men communists. You had them, for instance, in Yugoslavia. They were always a minority. I knew. I mean, I won't go into personal details. Let's say I knew personally even people that they are now dead who, who participated in Second World War. They were really idealistic and were workers themselves. They were. Extremely rare. Most uh, uh, communists uh, pe were people precisely petty bourgeois or even upper upper class uh, journalists, intellectuals, writers, lawyers. Most of them, unfortunately, uh, elementary school teachers. That's real perversity. <laughs> that is to say, low to middle strata of these non-working class professions. And those people have this tendency to want to break out of this. And you really get a peculiar feeling because uh, if, you, if you know workers, if, if you ever did work for a longer period of time without safety net, social safety net, uh, if you live on the, so to speak, edge of the knife, that you feel uh, that you are very much aware that tomorrow you can hit the rock bottom of society and nobody will be there to pick you up. If you've been there, you don't need to seek to go all the way in radicality because your very every day is damn radical. But that's this, this is just a note what is interesting uh, in these hypocrites. And they love to... Like uh, they like to say, uh, unmask the hypocrisy of others and deconstruct and blah blah blah. But they are as hypocritical as they can get. Although <laughs> Slava is genius to weasel out of 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 uh, accusations such as this, <laughs> and I like him for that because he genuinely has sense of humor. He's a horrible man, but uh, can make make one laugh. Uh, and so he ends up with this. And we have a name for this and this, this mistake. It's called love. Isn't love precisely this kind of cosmic imbalance? I was always disgusted with the notion of I love the world, universal love. I don't like the world. I'm basically someone in between. I hate the world or I'm indifferent towards it. But the whole of reality 
it's just it. It's stupid. It's out there. I don't care about it. Love for me is an extremely violent act. Love is not, I love you all. Love means, I pick out something. And you know, again, it's the structure of a balance. Even if this something is just a small detail, a fragile individual person, I say I love you more than anything else. In this quite formal sense, love is evil. Now, let us just see what kind of sorcery, uh, or better to say necromancy, is being done here. And this last sen sentence I repeat, in this quite formal sense, love is evil. Uh, Zizek's assumption, and I would say his deepest personal conviction, the very building block of his uh, diffuse, uh, uh, elusive personality, is the idea that everything is upside down. That is to say that uh, uh, upside down, uh, our notion that something can be ordered or can be uh, meaningful or purposeful, comes from perversion, from, from some totalitarian impulse to cope with uh, the fact that we are atoms and void. Because what he described here is nothing more than what Leukippus or Democritus, the ancient atomists, would say that world is. This is the ontological mood that comes from materialism. And in this sense, if this is being... Being is good. And this is what you see. This is how you see that people, no matter how uh, hostile they are towards tradition, end up, end up expressing traditional uh, standpoint. Because what he said here is love is evil because it disturbs the disorder of being. Because in normal, in normal mind, being is in order. Although order is not the word I like because it has this political and fatalistic connotation, although originally it is not. There's a chain, Seira in Greek, in Proclus, for instance, now Platonist, uh, some Christian thinkers. But, uh, cosmos, uh, let's say, or the Greek word for world. For, uh, for Zizek, it's rather chaos, although qualified chaos. It's not really chaos, it's matter. So it's something that can be understood. But what he fails to see here, probably, and does it, nevertheless, is that even this has to be considered as good, because it is being. So love is evil because it disturbs this inverted being. Now love is most definitely not evil. And saying I love you is not evil. Although it does make a disturbance in the pattern of things but i would say that rather it makes it, it 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 creates disturbance in the inversion of things to which we are conforming now this is something that uh, is far from the scale, uh, scope of a uh, subject and it's something that is better expressed in other ways artistic maybe and so on if expressed at all but let's let's just uh, let's just put out statement and ask our listeners to um, take it on face value and co and and don't try uh, don't ask uh, proofs for it. Just that uh, expressing love, unconditional love to a person <clears throat> in our day and age is quite a revolutionary act, but for entirely different reasons that uh, Zizek here. Uh, Zizek here uh, expresses because uh, this is more like a reinstitution of order or reclaiming of right to be of right to to unqualifiedly uh, give you all heart so what we have here in this uh, materialist mentality is a kind of philosophy of animated corpse i will give you one example still one more example of what i mean orwell's george orwell's 1984 this book has always had for me this same gave me same sense as zizek's uh, 
Zizek's mood and attitude and and uh, attitude of some other leftists I knew not not so much Anglo-Saxon so I cannot put forward an example. Uh, what happens in 1984? 1984 is a book about two people among other things. It's a book about many things, but among other things, it's about two people who tend to have uh, to fight the world and absolute totalitarian state for the right to have sexual intercourse and that is not really uh, uh, not really emotional at that it is really uh, simply a physical intercourse as an act of rebellion against the state and big brother and it is understood as such as this is something that is uncontrollable uh, by the political power and therefore it is forbidden that people indulge indulge in it in 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 their own on their own choosing but the state controls everything of course this uh, this sexual revolution fails miserably uh, i won't go into into book too much but it is a, in the end failure and this is something uh, this is completely materialist premise which is to me rather peculiar for george orwell who was uh, quite a uh, subtler uh, man and and it kind of like it's out of place uh, i think when compared to his other works but okay that's it is what it is uh this book for instance gives me this feeling because this is the feeling that both uh, uh, the rebel uh, and 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 the authority in the end end up the same uh, they end up as a food for worms, and the reason for any act for for anything is in fact a mistake, pushing the mistake to its end. And people who are uh, who who really have this attitude to the world are uh, for somebody who is essentially religious, a complete aliens. They can be good colleagues. They can understand each other perfectly. They can collaborate. Now I'm talking about uh, when I say materialist. I mean uh, they are wrong. But I, uh, for instance, I would take a lot of Zizek's uh, statements. For instance, on war in Yugoslavia, and such. So very intelligent. Uh, that are. But this man, for me, for instance, just to take one personal note, is a complete alien. No difference in race, no difference in sex, no difference in ethnicity, no difference in religion, mind you, could make me feel, uh, could make somebody feel that alien as I feel, as this attitude makes him alien to, for me, for instance. But uh, it's not uh, my personal thing, it's a thing of mentality in which both of us participate he participates in one, I participate in other. Now, this is not the last thing, this materialism and this mentality and this mood of morbidity, I would even say, is not the last word. The last word now, the last shriek that could go indefinitely is that which is below this. It is that which transcends corporeality and extrinsic, which puts nothingness where nothingness belongs, everywhere. And that means also inside you. And this is not anymore the nothingness of void, uh, that uh, nevertheless you can act upon with <laughs> electricity, because it is not really nothing, it's just unformed or ill-formed matter. This is something entirely different and this is something that is not modern and we argued and even in our last few works, especially in the last long article called uh, uh, New Age and Shadows, we talked about this, the ancient origin of what comes uh, to the surface, what lurks from, uh, from lurking in the shadows now comes into light. In postmodernity, there's something quite different. Materialism, it comes from below because materialism is directed below. As you can very easily see from this Zizek's uh, thinking. But now, uh, but materialism has this uh, 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 safety, 
mechanism. It stands on matter. It is external. It 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 materializes everything. It 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 mortifies everything. It makes everything look like and feel like a fucking uh, excuse my French uh, mortuary. This is this is how those people see the world. So please don't ever get fooled into thinking that they are motivated by social justice. That they are not. You have to you have to have a certain affection to human beings. You have to love somebody or to 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 to, to have this uh, urge. They don't have it. They have system urges. They have uh, power uh, power motives. They want to change world. They want to uh, recreate matter for uh, reform this matter in a different way as they see fit because only thing in this world they have they feel they have is the ability to reform the matter into some other shape i would say but this other thing <laughs> that we uh, often address on kali tribune is something far more sinister and older than this and the feeling that it gives can even be seducive can it really put you uh, on the track of uh, following it thinking that there is some kindred soul out there who says matter is not all but there is something infra material something under matter something infra human or subhuman there is in a word not transcendence but infrascendence <laughs> to coin the word in latin <laughs> But uh, anybody who knows, follows Holy Tribune knows that we already did a lot of work on it and there will be much more. Thank you for your attention. Hopefully this was informative and enlightening. This was Branko Malic of Kali Tribune signing out. Mm-hmm.